Okay, so let's continue with our uh, exploration of some of the uh, tensors associated with the Riemann tensor, the Riemann curvature tensor. Last lesson, we derived an equation that looked a little like this. And our goal, understand what our goal was. Our goal was an interpretation. The idea being that we understand that the Riemann tensor is something that exists, and we've thought very closely about why, mu, nu, alpha, beta. We studied this guy. We talked about it in terms of separating geodesics. That was a geodesic interpretation method. And we also uh, derived it in terms of uh, parallel transport of a vector around a little square. Remember, we had a vector here, and we parallel transported it this way and this way. And then we got a, a, a difference between the vector at that point. So as we derived this structure, as we took the properties of space-time, the properties of the manifold that all flow from the connection, right? Everything flows from the connection. The connection implied this property, and it directly implied the existence of this 0, 3 tensor, right? And so the derivation itself gave us an interpretation, right? We're able to think of these things as this tensor, the Riemann curvature tensor, can be interpreted as the machine, the tensor machine that absorbs certain vectors and tells us about the, the acceleration between two nearby geodesics. Likewise, we could say if we parallel tr a transport a vector from one point around a little loop, we know that it doesn't end up at, this, at the opposing part of the loop with being the same vector. Or likewise, another way of thinking of it is taking a vector and parallel transporting it around a loop, and when it returns, it's not the same vector. Uh, wait a second, wait a second. It's a 1-3 tensor. Sorry, guys. It's a 1-3, one, 1-3 three, one, three tensor. Um, but then the idea, I was just saying, it would come around and it would be back here, and it's still a deviation. Either way, the point being that this tensor can be understood as informing us about properties of space-time that are actually pretty easy to understand. Once you understand geodesics, the geodesic deviation and the parallel transport idea um, is, is pretty simple to, to capture. And we have a good way, therefore, of interpreting what this tensor is all about. And that interpretation dropped directly from its derivation. That was not true for the Ricci tensor. And the entire last lecture was to go from the Riemann tensor and play around with ideas in space-time and ultimately derive this notion that now does let us interpret the Ricci tensor, at least in one way. And we basically created the interpretation that if we established, let's let me move it over here, if we established a little volume in space-time, a spherical volume in space-time, and we asserted that each of the dust particles in that space-time was oriented or had a motion in space-time, a space-time path at some instant, t equals zero, say, uh, and that was given by a vector x, then we know that whatever the volume whatever the volume was and the reason I, the whether the volume of that sphere was that volume is going to accelerate and that acceleration that accelerating volume um, is given by this number right here and by this expression and so the ergo the Riemann or the Ricci tensor or that first contraction or the one and only contraction of the Riemann curvature tensor informs us something about how the volume, the size of the volume accelerates uh, given, um, given the, uh, the initial volume. Uh, now, the other word that's commonly thrown about in this process, and that word is intuition, and I use it sometimes. I shouldn't, though. Intuition is not uh, the right word here. Intuition talk is, is something that Whenever, most of the time when people use intuition, what they're trying to do is they're trying to escape the math. They're trying to not dig in and study and understand the origins of these things in its minute detail and its pure abstract form. They want to skip all that and eh, just get me an intuitive picture of what this is all about. And they try to learn the math with some sort of intuitive guide. They think some sort of intuitive guide exists that'll get you there. And 
having studied this for many years and have actually been in that trap at one point, I can assure you it's a fool's errand. There's no way, the, the proper way to do this is to study the, uh, the detailed mathematics, as, as complex and as abstract as it is, and then go back and make sure you have an interpretation of that. You, there's, no, there's no way through it. And this word is typically more of this idea of, you know, maybe I can escape understanding the math. This word says, now that I know the math, what is it trying to tell me? And that's where you want to be when you study uh, this material or any, any scientific material at all. Okay, so now the goal of this lecture is to start a path to do the same thing and come up with an interpretation of the reach scalar, or the curvature scalar, I guess I should call it. And the curvature scalar is actually a metric-derived tensor because the curvature scalar is defined by taking the Ricci tensor, right, and contracting it with uh, the metric to get a contraction of the Ricci tensor, which is just a scalar that we call R. But notice that you can't do this without a metric, without a metric. You need the metric to do this. That was not the case back here, by the way, right? It seems like it, but when we derive this thing, and you can go back and do this, when we derive this object, uh, it, all it depended on was a connection. If you give me a connection inside this manifold, that will be sufficient to define this creature, this, the, um, the Riemann tensor. And it's, the notion of general relativity is such is that there is a metric, and that metric defines the unique curvature called the Levy I'm sorry, the unique um, connection called the Levy Civita connection, or the metric connection is another way of saying it. So we, in general relativity, we are presuming the existence of a metric, but that's an additional feature, right? That's an additional. A manifold will have. Uh, can have a, a connection that's unrelated to any metric. You can have a metric-free manifold with a connection defined on it, and you'll still have a, um, a Riemann tensor. And you'll still have a Ricci tensor, because you can always contract on this Riemann tensor. But having a Ricci tensor um, to, get, uh, to get the scalar, you need to raise an index, which is equivalent to saying you need to have access uh, unambiguous access to the covector space, right? You have to convert one of these vector slots into a covector slot. And to do that, the only way to do that canonically is with a metric, as far as I know. So let's just say I'm claiming that you need this metric to make this last step. It's a, it's a metric-induced tensor. Now, the good news is that this great paper, and this paper that I'm really coming to enjoy, or at least the, I'm enjoying the parts I'm reading, um, it's quite long, so I'm, I'm not claiming to have read the whole thing, but the parts I'm reading that I enjoy a lot does have a, a very serious discussion of the interpretation of the curvature scalar, just like it did for the Ricci tensor. So we're going to go through that. But to get there, we have to go through another concept. We have to go through another uh, uh, another uh, uh, notion that is very important in the proof. And that notion is the notion of normal coordinates, often called Riemann normal coordinates. And this is one of those topics I, that is presented. It's actually pretty, this is an important topic. It's The problem with this topic is that it doesn't necessarily need to be known as a precursor to studying the basic things of elementary general relativity. You don't need it to understand black holes, you don't need it to understand uh, geodesics, you don't need it to understand anything specific. On the other hand, it's kind of important, I think, for a real good grasp of the equivalence principle, right? I think understanding this as equivalence principle is good. It also gives a good feel for um, how to imagine laboratory frames in uh, curved space-time. So it is a really pretty important idea. It's got a related concept called Fermi normal coordinates, and I think what I'll do in this lecture is I'll discuss both of these just to, as an introduction. Um, when no, Riemann normal coordinates are important is in helping prove other things, and so to, our goal is to come up with a proof that 
lands us with an equation for that explains r. See, what we're basically looking for is just like this. We had an equation that tells us something about how to interpret the Ricci tensor. Well, we're looking for a similar equation for r. And to get there, it's actually a pretty lengthy process. But to get there, we have to go through this concept of Riemann normal coordinates. And basically what we're going to say is, let's imagine we have a situation in space-time. Let's erect a set of Riemann normal coordinates at that point. So that's a very loaded phrase. You need to understand what Riemann normal coordinates are and believe that they can be put. And we can always put them and establish them in any space-time. So that's going to be the focus of this lecture. And then once we do that in our next lecture, we'll start the, the long march to the curvature scalar. Okay, so let's begin. So we'll begin by considering the space of special relativity. So this is all now uh, simply special relativity. Another way of thinking of that is simply that the metric of space-time, g mu nu, is... is uh, uh, given by minus 1, 1, 1, and 1, uh, the diagonal elements of, of, of this tensor. And that's true everywhere. So there's no gravity, no curvature anywhere in this story. So I'll align the time axis of our global coordinate system. So we have some global coordinate system in our space-time. Let's just say you could say it's uh, just a Cartesian system. And we have the x1 coordinate system here, and we'll suppress the other two dimensions for now. And we're going to talk about movement that's arbitrary in this space-time. Uh, Time-like, but arbitrary. So we'll assume, of course, that C equals 1. And, and so time-like movement would be constrained to this sort of 45-degree light cone, right? right? And we're measuring time in units of distance, right? So you've got to be pretty good with that, right? You have to have the idea in your head that time is measured in units of distance, and that's because the fundamental constant of nature, the speed of light, is equal to 1. In fact, that's so important that I'm going to erase this and make it look much better. C equals 1, right? And ergo, uh, in, when you do that and you draw graphs of it, you end up with light cones that have 45 degrees of, of, uh, of angle, which is nice because you can now determine immediately what is a future-directed, time-like path. So now we take our, our particle here, and we allow it to have an arbitrary movement as long as it's time-like, right? Now notice what I just drew. That does not satisfy... I, I just drew a really bad time-like curve. Just because it's contained in the forward light cone doesn't mean it's time-like, right? Obviously, if you blew up this part of it, it's moving from this point in space to this point in space much faster than the speed of light, right? So this curve is a disaster. So I've already screwed up this explanation. So let me undo that curve. And the idea is we need to keep the curve so it's the path is less than 45 degrees. So, for example, if it was just sitting still, it'd be going like this, right? A straight line. Sitting still in its own reference frame, obviously. But then it's allowed to move, but it can never move beyond 45 degrees in, in slope, right? So if I started doing that, that'd be bad, right? So I can do this and this, but, oops, see, it's so easy to screw this up, right? So let's just do this. Ah, there it is, screwed up again. Regardless, it can be otherwise arbitrary. That's not even good, right? Right? So here, let's say I, it, it turns on its gen engines and it's really kissing the speed of light there, but it doesn't, right? And then it comes back to motion. The point is, is that this can be an arbitrary movement of an arbitrary curve in space-time. We're not forcing it to be an inertial frame in special relativity. Now, in special relativity, the notion of an inertial frame is just the same as in any other uh, elementary physics. Uh, rectilinear motion in a constant, with a constant velocity, counts as an inertial frame in special relativity. Um, in general relativity, of course, a special, uh, an inertial frame is any frame in free fall, right? Any kind of free fall whatsoever uh, counts as an inertial frame. But in special relativity, it's always straight line, motion, constant velocity. That's not what's going on here, right? This guy is straight line motion at a constant velocity here in principle. You know, maybe if you blew it up real carefully, you'd realize, oh, he's still moving a little bit. But 
assume that's a straight line. So if he's an inertial frame right here, he or she, and then there's some acceleration here. And perhaps if that line is straight, perhaps he's, there's an inertial frame here going very, very fast, almost at the speed of light. Definitely relativistic speeds right there. Then there's acceleration here and it, it slows down. But all in all, this is, this is not an inertial frame for this entire period of time. So now consider this this laboratory, this little mini part, this particle that takes its own reference frame with it, right? Right now we're looking at a global reference frame, right? And this is an important point that hangs with us in general relativity too. This, these coordinates map out the entire space time and they don't attach to any observer, right? There's not necessarily an observer who has this coordinate system uh, naturally attached to them. In other words, it doesn't represent, I guess the way to think of it is this X zero time axis does not necessarily have to represent the proper time of any observer. Uh, in special relativity, it almost always does. I, I mean, in fact, I can't think of a situation in special relativity where the time axis uh, doesn't represent the proper time of somebody. There is this light cone um, coordinates that exist in special relativity, and I guess that would not uh, reflect the proper time of any observer. Um, but in, th in this case, all right, I guess fair enough, right? In this case, there is an observer here whose coordinate system is in fact uh, defined by this x0 and x1 uh, very well. I guess I could draw that observer right here. And that person is, is stationary with respect to the center of the coordinate system. So the, this, this uh, scientist's proper time is given by x0. In general relativity, by the way, just that does ne not always happen. In fact, it almost never happens that the coordinate systems that we use to globally define things really represents the proper time of anybody in particular. I mean, it does happen, right? Uh, the Schwarzschild coordinates... Uh, represent sort of the proper time of a far away observer but any version of it the eddington finkelstein coordinates and all those other coordinates all the ones we talked about early in the course there's no observer whose proper time is uh, associated necessarily with the x0 axis but in special relativity that's not a problem in this uh, this case uh the, you know we have this guy who's this lab frame out there but the point is is the thing about relativity is that the lab frame of this guy is no different in principle than the lab frame of this guy. There's nothing preferred about this frame. So we want to talk a little bit about what is the lab frame of this cat. And if you went into there and you blew it up, you would get a laboratory. So let's, let's do that. Let's say we blew this up and here's the little laboratory that's moving along that purple world line, right? And there's the little box that represents the laboratory. Now, the reason I'm drawing a little box is I want to represent a small laboratory because in general relativity, you can only consider laboratories that are so small that the space-time inside there uh, really can't detect the curvature of, of the global space-time. In special relativity, that doesn't matter. There's no curvature to detect. But let's, for the sake of uh, just anticipating moving into the curved space-time, let's consider a small local laboratory that's got this motion, right? This is the motion that it's following. So inside that laboratory, you can create a frame of reference. You can create a, a, a vector frame. You can say, I'm moving in time in the E0 direction, and then I have three space directions, E1, E2, and then E3, which I have to suppress here. Remember, this is space-time. It's four-dimensional. So I, I can erect my little coordinate system and draw it to explain everything, but I have to say that the E0 direction is the time direction, and E1 and E2 are the space directions inside the little lab. So I guess maybe the, the better way to do this is to take my little lab and suppress its dimension also, right? So my little lab actually looks like a, a, a square instead of... Um, uh, 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 instead of a little cube. So what's up with these, these uh, basis vectors? Well, remember, so now we've got this guy who lives inside this laboratory, right? Here he is. And this is the coordinate system he sets up. Now, 
his partner, I guess I'll do the old Alice and Bob. So this is Bob, right? And this is Alice, right? So Alice, when she looks at his coordinate system, at this point in time, when he's not moving, when Bob is not moving relative to Alice, Alice believes that the time vector that Bob sees is just equal to her basis vector, um, uh, her uh, x0 basis vector. I should do the dx, whoops, uh, hold on, um, uh, partial x0, which is also defined as partial 0. So they're aligned. The two space, the two time-like vectors are aligned. And E1 equals partial 1. So they're all the same. So Alice's reference system and Bob's reference system are exactly, uh, are exactly the same. Now, at some point, Bob starts to accelerate. And that point is right here, where this curve starts to bend. And at that point, he has a... a his coordinate system is going to be different than hers. And it's going to be different by a Lorentz transformation, right? Because this is a, here at Bob has achieved some velocity. And when you achieve a velocity in special relativity, your reference frame or the reference frames compared to the lab always changes by a Lorentz transformation. And so the way we may treat that is we would write that, uh, Bob is now. Uh oh, there's going to be a crow bothering me. Hold on. Okay, so in this circumstance, now this guy's got some velocity, right? He's Bob has uh, accelerated for a period of time, and now there's some velocity. So the relationship between his new Bob's new basis vector. Uh, let's see, hold on. His new basis vector, I'll call that e zero prime, is equal to some Lorentz transformation. Um, I guess it would be uh, uh, 0, 0 prime E0, right? And this is a Lorentz transformation that uh, expresses that change. Now, the problem with this is that there's actually a lot of Lorentz transformations that will represent this change because not only does uh, the... Um, the, not, not only be, because you can rep represent Lorentz transformations don't don't just represent boosts, right? Rep Lorentz transformations represent boosts plus rotations, right? Right. So you can have many uh, different Lorentz transformations that will will change this time vector, this uh, time like basis vector that will also induce some additional rotation, right? It's not just going to be the velocity involved. It will also be some arbitrary rotation. And so you can now imagine that uh, not only would the, uh, the, the time-like basis vector shift, and, and actually what it does is it tilts and rotates, but there's some mixture between e1 prime uh e1 prime ends up equaling some uh, it, it it starts to rotate too it's it rotates as well so we don't want that we want to just have the lorentz transformation that all it does the only thing that the lorentz transformation does is it rotates e0 so that E0 is always pointing uh, in uh, the direction of the velocity, the, the four velocity, right? So when I write this here, I've written, shoot, I keep screwing this up. Uh, when I draw this velocity here, I'm talking, it usually looks like, oh, it's moving, it's an, a velocity in the x1 direction. And that is what it sort of means in the special relativity picture. But the truth is, is that the velocity vector is actually uh, off tangential to the world line, right? So if I blew up the world line, the velocity vector here is in this direction, but here it's in that direction, and here it's in this direction. The velocity vector is always tangent. I mean, that's the definition of the velocity vector, right? It's tangent to the world line. So what we want for our coordinate system is we want 
E0, E0 for the coordinate system of Bob has always got to be uh, proportional to Bob's four velocity, which would be uh, V mu, right? V mu, V mu partial mu. We want E0 to always be proportional to the four velocity. And that's another way of saying, that's just the fancy mathematical way of saying that this reference frame is not moving relative to Bob. It's Bob's, uh, it, Bob is fixed in this reference frame, right? All of the velocity of this reference frame is wrapped up in the time vector and everything else sits still. So if it, this, is, this is the definition of a reference frame fixed relative to Bob. The time-like part is proportional to the, uh, the four velocity. So now when you look at that, when you think of it in that, those terms, you say, well, so what gives? Uh, let, me, let me draw this a little bit cleaner. Okay, so here's a, a slightly cleaner picture of, of this. Uh, when when, it, when uh, Bob is motionless, E0 and the world line, well, E0 is always tangent to the world line. So when he's motionless and the world line is vertical, our picture has E0 being vertical. He undergoes a period of brief period of acceleration, and then the, the world line is now moving off to the, uh, you know, sloped off to the right, not 45 degrees, because that would violate uh, the speed of light. But um, it's enough now that the velocity vector has now tilted in space-time, right? Remember, this is all space-time. So we have x0 going this way, and we have x1 going that way. And once it's tilted, we want his lab frame, to, we, we're interested in the frame that such that uh, the basis vector is exactly aligned with the velocity vector. And that's what I have here. This is to show you that this basis vector is now tangent to the velocity vector. And what's the velocity vector? Well, it's what's, I'm sorry, the basis vector is parallel to the velocity vector, which is tangent to the world line. So you're supposed to think of this as some sort of tangency here. Maybe if I, maybe if I draw a little dotted line here and a dotted line there, and you kind of see that that's tangent right there. Okay, so obviously the Lorentz transformation we're interested in is a rotation that rotates E0 to E0 prime. Now everything's normalized, right? Because we do have a metric, despite, you know, it's flat space-time has a metric, right? We just usually call it eta, alpha, beta, right? It has a metric, so everything is orthogonal and everything can be measured, therefore everything can be normalized. So we're assuming we have normalized uh, basis vectors and we're interested in the Lorentz transformation that rotates E0 to E0 prime. So now, to think about a rotation of a vector in four-dimensional space-time is actually uh, something that we have to re-sort of rejigger our brains to get around. Because what we usually say is, okay, I've got some body. Let's, uh, let me just draw some body in blue. And this body, whatever it is, uh, we're going to rotate it. So I usually think of... Uh, you know, if you're an engineer or, or a, a physicist that's only studied the elementary physics, you think of some vector, and then you think of some angular velocity, and you call that vector, um, you might call that vector the angular velocity vector omega, and omega points in a direction that's perpendicular to the plane of rotation, right? So normally we think of the vector, the angular velocity is perpendicular to the plane of rotation. But we always fixate on this angular velocity vector, and then we understand how something might rotate uh, around that axis. So we're thinking of rotation around an axis, and it's also uh, interpreted as inter rotation around a plane of rotation. And if you had a, you know, there's going to be some uh, basis system, right? There's going to be some basis system, you know, I guess it would be I, J, you know, K hat, right? Those are the basis vectors. And once you define omega in terms of I, J, and K hat, you decompose it in terms of the basis, you can find uh, two basis, two vectors that define the plane of rotation, which would be the plane completely orthogonal to omega,
And this is just really routine stuff that we get very used to when we try to understand rotations. The problem is that the relationship between a vector like this and a plane like this that can be defined unambiguously orthogonal to each other only exists in three dimensions. You cannot you cannot elevate that thinking into four dimensions or five dimensions or any other number of dimensions. I, I think you might be a, I think there's a couple other examples of dimensions where you can do that, but th it's not relevant to any work. And you might as well just presume that it can only be done in three dimensions. And therefore, when we think of a rotation of this vector here in four dimensional space, because that's what's happening. We're, we're taking this basis vector, this, the time like basis vector, um, Presuming that the other three basis vectors are orthogonal to the time-like basis vectors, that the, ergo that means they are by definition space-like, right? So the three other spaces basis vectors here, e1, e1, e2, and e3, they are definitely space-like because they're orthogonal to this one, and this one's totally time-like by definition. So the point is, is rotating this vector from this position to this position in four-dimensional space, you can't think of a single axis that uh, you can rotate around to do that. It doesn't exist. The number of these vectors and the number of these planes is not the same, except coincidentally in three dimensions. If you want a more deeper analysis of that, you go back to the what is a tensor series. And in some of the later lectures, I talk about this in depth, where what's really going on here is this... We, if we call this a vector and these guys co-vectors, um, there's different uh, uh, spaces, different exterior power spaces that have different dimensionalities that only seem to equal in the case of three. I don't want to go into it now, but suffice to say, you've got to get away from thinking about rotating around a vector. However, you can always think about rotating in a plane, right? A plane of rotation is the fundamental way of thinking about rotations. You, if you can define a plane in any dimension, uh, you can always think about rotating in that plane. Uh, so, uh, in this case, we need to be able to think of a plane of rotation. What's the plane that E0 is going to be rotating in to move from this orientation to this orientation. And when I talk about these two different orientations, I'm talking about it relative to this lab frame, right? Shoot, I always erase when I don't mean to, when I mean to point. I'm talking about the, the rotation relative to the lab frame, because all of these vectors for right now are going to be defined in terms of the lab frame. So E0 is going to equal yeah, E0, which is the time-like basis vector of Bob, is going to be defined in Alice's sort of universal frame, which is allowable in special relativity, to be something like, um, uh, uh, let's see, something like, what would it, what would be, alpha 1, uh, alpha 0, partial 0, plus alpha 1, partial 1, plus alpha 2, partial 2, plus alpha 3, partial three. Oh, that's my alphas and my partials are beginning to look alike here. Uh, alpha three, partial three, right? And we know that in the case where Bob is um, stationary in Alice's frame, which is exactly this area right here, uh, uh, this just equals partial zero, right? All the coefficients are zero or one. And then... Uh, E0 prime is just some other set of numbers, right? Beta 0 uh, uh, partial 0 plus beta 1 partial 1 plus beta 2 partial 2 plus beta 3 partial 3. And uh, notice that I could write that as, write that this way, right? Where this expression, beta 0 prime, 0 prime is not an index in this expression, right? The index is here. This is just naming the vector, right? This is the name of a vector. E0 is the name of the basis vector that points in the time-like direction or the velocity, the four-velocity direction of Bob. And E0 
there's four of those different vectors, E0, E01, E02, E03, and they are themselves vectors that have to be expressed in terms of a basis, and the basis we're using is Alice's basis in this case. So E, when I write E0 prime, that's another vector. Now it happens to be Bob's basis vector, so in his world, he will, uh, he'll end up calling that something like partial zero uh, Bob, right? This will be partial zero in Bob's frame, right? In principle, if he was to do experiments based on it. Okay, anyway, the point is, is that we need to understand the plane of rotation that uh, defines the movement of this, this uh, uh, time-like basis vector for Bob. And that plane of rotation, uh, well, it certainly is a plane that contains E0, right? We, want, we don't want to change the length or size of E0. So whatever that plane is, it's actually going to contain E0, which, which, which we would think about in terms of, you know, if we had a plane and there was a vector in the plane and we want to rotate that vector in the plane, we um, uh, want the plane that, and we don't want the vector to change uh, size, we will, uh, the, the plane will have to contain the vector. So to define this plane, we, we're halfway there, right? We need two vectors to define a plane, but we've got one. The point is, is what's the other vector that's lying in the same plane that will unambiguously define this plane as opposed to say, say there's the same vector, say this plane, right? Which might, you know, be a little more vertical through it or something like that, right? What's the second vector that is unambiguously defined by this world line. I'll let you think about this for a second. Maybe you want to pause the video and think about it. This world line is clearly defined by its tangent vector, right? But that doesn't unambiguously define a plane, right? It just defines a single vector. There's an infinite number of planes that contain E0, and I could rotate through all of them. But I only want to rotate through one of them, and that one will give us this new vector here, what is the other vector that's unambiguously defined by this world line that uh, I can use to define the plane of rotation? Oops, see, I lost my, my end there. And the answer is it's the acceleration vector, right? It's the acceleration vector A, the four acceleration, A mu. And the four acceleration is always unambiguously defined by the rule that the velocity dotted into the four acceleration, the four velocity dotted into the four acceleration, which I'll make a script A, always equals zero, right? In special relativity, this is such a critical point to understand. The four velocity of anything at any time in any place dotted into the four acceleration of that object is always going to be zero. And the reason this is the case is that the magnitude of the four velocity of anything, any time, at any place, is always equal to the speed of light, which in our situation is one. The magnitude of any object, any energy, anything in the entire universe, the magnitude of its four velocity is always equal to one. And yet, things do accelerate, right? They do accelerate, but they accelerate in such a way that the magnitude of the four velocity never changes. Ergo, all four accelerations must obey this principle right here, that the four acceleration dotted into the velocity is equal to zero. That means the four acceleration can never be, it can never have any component in the direction of the four velocity. And, and of course that makes sense. Right? Imagine you're in Bob's frame, right? You're sitting in Bob's frame and you're proceeding along in space time with a four velocity that is, uh, you know, you erect a frame where the E0 is in your time direction. So it's, it's basically ticking off units of a clock, right? In units of meters in our example, right? If your four acceleration had a component along that direction, then all of a sudden you would find yourself moving quicker through time. You could kind of build a time machine. You could move quicker or slower through time. You could accelerate and turn your time vector into the opposite direction. Right? And we can't do that, right? We cannot change our rate in our laboratory of going through time, right? Um, obviously, the Lorentz transformation makes clocks tick at different rates. But if this were possible, your own experience of time 
would suddenly start to change. And that's crazy. Um, well, it's also just not the way things are, right? Special relativity, ultimately, uh, this is a consequence of the fundamental assumption that there's no preferred reference frame, that the speed of light is measured to be the same by everybody, you know, regardless of their state of motion. All of that leads to this conclusion. We interpret this conclusion as to say you can never accelerate your way through time. So we can look, we can sort of look at this situation here, right? Where there's our for velocity, well, what's our for acceleration? Well, it's got to be orthogonal to it. So we're assuming that we're only accelerating the x direction, right? The y and z direction have been isolated from the problem. So there, there's the for acceleration. So that's a, and that's e0, and that defines the plane of rotation, which in our picture is very satisfactory, right? It, that's exactly the plane for which e0 does in fact rotate. And then at this point, the four acceleration always has to be orthogonal. So it's always still going to have to be uh, perpendicular to this. So if we, so the, the upshot of this is if we find the Lorentz transformation that moves, that only rotates in that plane, and that's the only Lorentz transformation we execute, that is, um, so we, we advance down the world line and then we, uh, reestablish a reference frame for Bob based entirely on the Lorentz transformation that is a rotation in the uh, E0A plane, right? So it's got to be a little infinitesimal advance down the world line. Subsequent, when, when we, we do the advance down the world line a little bit, and then we rotate uh, E0 in the E0 alpha uh, acceleration plane, that is called Fermi-Walker transport of, uh, of this reference frame. That reference frame has been Fermi-Walker transported. And understand what this is. This is this Fermi-Walker transport is relevant to uh, Alice, right, who's out here watching this. Alice has to decide what does the reference frame of Bob look like. You know, Bob is sitting here in his reference frame. After Bob has moved an infinitesimal amount down his world line, right? I know what his basis vectors were here, says Alice, because they were the same as mine, because he was not moving relative to me. But then he starts to accelerate. Well, now I have to Lorentz transform his basis system. Well, I'm going to do that in the most efficient way possible. I'm going to do the Lorentz transform that rotates his uh, time-like basis vector uh, in uh, what I understood to be his uh, his... Uh, time-like basis vector, the plane that was or uh, that was defined by the time-like basis vector, and the acceleration that I've observed, and then I recalculate, and now I know what his new basis system looks like, and I can be assured because I forced the rotation to be in this plane that there was no unnecessary rotation of just the spatial basis vectors. Those guys do get rotated, but they don't get rotated beyond any more than is absolutely necessary to realign his uh, Bob's uh, spatial uh, or his Bob's time-like basis vector with uh, his purely with his four velocity, right? He realigns his time-like vector with his four velocity. Okay, so that is Fermi-Walker transport, and that exists entirely in um, uh, the special relativity world. But notice what's nice about it is. You know, special relativity, we usually, you know, do all our paradoxes and our introductions and things like that, our, our basic study of it, comparing two different uh, inertial frames. But this allows us to talk about an arbitrarily accelerated observer, right? We can figure out what that observer's laboratory frame looks like regardless of uh, their, their state of motion. What we're doing, though, is we're saying there's only infinitesimal changes. This from here to here, in order to do a Lorentz transformation from here to here, um, I, I've got to consider just this instant of motion, right? This instant of motion. And if this acceleration is very, very complex, I've got to make sure that um, the uh, the step-by-step -step infinitesimal, I've got to do this in infinitesimal steps, right? I've got to do this along the world line, but very, very carefully to make sure that uh, the four acceleration is constant along the, the, the period of time that I am uh, engaging in this, this, this flip uh, or this, uh, this transformation.
Okay, so that's Fermi Walker Transport. So um, I think I'll end it there because to now we have to take Fermi Walker Transport and understand it in terms of curved space time. And that's what Riemann normal coordinates are. Riemann normal coordinates are understanding sort of Fermi Walker Transport in the context of curved space time. And the complications that are introduced by curved space time is well, first of all, you don't have the coordinate system you're dealing with isn't necessarily uh, the proper time of Alice. So Alice has to sort of be removed from the picture as a sort of separate observer. So that's one little issue. That's not a, a tough one. And then um, uh, on top of that, we have to understand that uh, the lab has to be very small relative to um, relative to uh, all of the geodesics and separation of space-time. In other words, you can't detect geodesic separation in a lab because it's so tiny and and the last problem seems to be it's it's sort of a the last problem is a bit of a a challenge to even understand because what we when we look at this situation we understand the direction x1 and x0 we understand the orthogonality we really understand how to define a reference frame for everybody involved but it's much more complex when you have an arbitrary coordinate system in a curved space time. You have to say, well, what does it mean? Like, like here, you look, say Bob looks out in the X1 direction. We kind of know where he's going to see forever and ever and ever. In curved space time, the, there's no sort of straight line in the, well, there is a straight line in the X1 direction, but it's a geodesic line. So we have to understand how that notion affects everything. And it does. It's a heavy, heavy, heavily affects everything. But it is still, um, uh, the, and also the idea of being an inertial observer is much more complicated because, uh, in curved space-time because in special relativity, we just need constant motion along a straight line. In general relativity, we're basically talking about an observer in free fall. And so we have to establish uh, free fall coordinates in th that are match along the world line infinitesimally. See, what we've done here is we've said at this moment, there's some reference frame that's got a, the exact same four velocity as Bob, and that reference frame at that instant has this coordinate system, and that reference frame at that instant is inertial. But the next instant, it's not. Uh, Bob has moved on into a new reference frame because Bob's motion is not inertial. Bob's got this curved motion here. And so uh, another reference frame exists that's instantaneously uh, co-moving with Bob but is inertial. And uh, understanding that in curved space time is just a little, little trickier. So we'll talk about that next time. All right.